So here we go, right? We're going to do it to podcast. Yeah, we've been waiting on you. All right, <laughs> and we have um, we have a truly a special been recording the whole time. No, no, I cut it. Oh, really good. Is <laughs> it recording now? <laughs> yeah, we're rolling. And we you're truly sure that podcast deal is she's rolling she's got okay. a red light over there we got nick in here so we're gonna make sure it's all <laughs> taken care so of so he comes directly off the short bus so <laughs> he's truly a special guest <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i'm allowed to say that or not so it'll be up to him if he wants to cut it so everybody gets two special guests still but you better let him know that we're down the the yeah, original we're, we're, other special guest we don't even know it's really crazy because today is his birthday and we're doing a podcast without him. And we don't even know if he's alive or not. I mean, we don't know anything. <laughs> we haven't heard or seen or no I've had all kinds of people texting me going, How's Easton's bear hunt going? I don't freaking know. If I if you knew I would know. If I knew you'd know. Because we've had no no communication, which is odd for any of us, but it's really like this has been a like like, the anticipation is killing me, you know? I've texted him I don't know how many times, knowing I'm not going to get an answer, but I'm like, okay. He's truly off-grid. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, when you, so anyhow, so for those of you that don't know, Easton is on an Idaho bear hunt, and they are 30 miles in um, from the town where they're at on up a gravel road. So he said he didn't have, think he would have service. I thought for sure somewhere in their hiking or something they would get a find a spot, a bar here or there and be able to shoot out a text, but apparently not, so... So anyhow, so here we are. Is there any um, thank you people that we got? People have left some reviews. They haven't wrote on them, but they've left us good reviews. So we appreciate good those. Good but work. Keep. We need some more. Keep flinging them. Um, Sean, I think it was Sean Wood. I hope I'm saying that right. Christo. Um, <laughs> He's like laying directly He's on He sent a message in because we mentioned him in the last podcast. Will you move him over? Yeah. And yeah. Christo, come here, bud. Let's see. Sean who? I thought it was Sean Wood, I'm, but I I want to make I want to <coughs> clarify. I'll introduce. So Nick is our one of our videographers and editors. In case you guys hadn't put that together yet, and he's really pretty much a new hunter as well. Now he's been hunting hard with us, but we've uh, shown him the ropes quite a bit. He he said he was a hunter, but then we found out <laughs> he just chased ducks and stuff. So. <laughs> Now we know he's actually becoming a hunter. So Sean Wood is. It, we mentioned him because he asked. So we did a, the last podcast was a lot of the stuff that he had asked about. So he was just saying he really appreciated. It. He said we crack him up. So we should really crack you up when <laughs> we have him on here. So I just telling you, you know. So he must um, have been enjoyed the camel part. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know. I don't know if that made it or not. It, um, it, part of it did. <laughs> okay. We tried to keep it as PG as possible. I think there's only okay. one hump in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's just wrong. Okay, let's do this because I'm going to get a new phone after we get done with this because this one has been smashed. All right, so today's topic, though, is a little bit about whitetail deer. We're going to talk a little bit about strategies of using trail cameras and really trying to hone in and find – that deer that you're after. Um, and we're going to kind of talk about that. We, we think we got some good intel. We got some we got some scenarios of our own to talk about. So did you bring a list of questions or you remember all of them? No, I remember it. I mean, really, I think is what this topic is, is this is going to be for anybody that's going hardcore. And, and I would say even more specifically, an individual deer. This yeah, you're doesn't trying- have that much application to just deer in general. Mm-hmm. This would be to, to the guy that it has one one deer and he has more than a year of history or at least a year of history meaning that you knew him last year during fall um of history with that deer on what you can be looking at right now and information that you can be trying to gather to help you kill that deer in fall and really i'm we were having a hard time finding a topic and i'm I'm pretty excited about this one now because i think that there's a lot of there's a lot of really good information in this I'm going to take this Absolutely. antler away from him because he I think is... you should leave it so that he doesn't get all annoying. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, um, if we can hear it, but... He's okay. Do we need to give you one if to you, chew on, too? <laughs> we just let people know that if you hear a crunching noise, it's the dog chewing on an antler. So... so all right. Well, let's talk which one do we want to... I mean, so I think the place to start, because um, we have had people write in and ask, where do we, where, what are we doing with trail cameras? And, and maybe we start with that kind of 
because trail cameras are only a piece of the puzzle, you know, just a portion of what we're uh, uh, trying to acquire or capture. And right now, um, we are able to use, we can utilize mineral, we can utilize bait, um, we can put food out or whatever we want. That's not necessarily, honestly, how I'm getting most of my intel, to be quite honest. Um, no, I don't think it's necessarily applicable to most. Um, as far as I think what we're going to talk about today, I don't know. I don't know how many states it's going to be applicable to as far as these deer moving their ranges. I think the trail cameras is a small part of this, really. I think we're more talking about what these deer are doing, like their habits, um, as far as where they're going, when they're there, why they leave. So I think, like, my first question to you would be is your summer deer now. You get a deer that's on camera all summer. And let's just say you have some history with this deer. Any deer that you have a picture of in the summer, do you believe you have a chance of hunting him in the fall? Not all of them. I, I would say it's a 50-50 shot. Okay, um, but you have history. So let's just say one one of the – let's just take three deer that you can think of that you have history with. Do you think you'll be able to hunt them in the fall on that existing – place and location or not uh, there's one in particular that i think he's going to be five years old this year he's not a big big deer um, we call him swoops um, because his main beams comes around and swoop up and i've, I've had history with him because we've known him he's kind of like another um uh straight up he's been on my farm you know and he keeps coming back keeps coming back keeps coming back um, he's usually the, he kind of is a homebody as far as living there now he moved last year in the summertime a couple miles away mile and a half away, but I found him, you know, but that didn't, but there was days when I would also see him back where I was originally seeing him, you know, so I would see him mile and a half away and then I'd see him back here. During the summer? During the summer he did it. In velvet? Mm -hmm. Really? Now, not as much as Nomad. Yeah. No, Nomad <laughs> yeah. was the king of, hence his name, you know, that deer was probably moving three, four miles, sometimes in a day. Yeah. In that, velvet. Yeah. Yeah, he was kind of an odd duck. Got I'd himself say, killed. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Of we it. we knew that was going to happen. Though. Yeah, we were sure that he was going to get shot because he was going way too many places. So I think that's what is really interesting here. Is I think we're we're honing in on to the different personalities of these deer, and uh, and I and I, I mean, they all have their own individual personalities, but I do think that there's kind of a few little subsectors of these deer on on habits. So like, I think you can have a homebody that has two homebodies. So, for instance, Swoops, I think that one of his homebodies is where he's at during the summer. He spends probably 85 to 90 percent of his time there. He doesn't go very far from there. Right. But then when it comes fall, he spends 95 percent of his time on us. And he's there pretty much all the time. Yep. Then you have other deer, like a Juice, that he his is the same. All, yeah, he yep, all year. He's always there. That's just where he lives. And then I think you have deer that are... Um, kind of like a nomad where they're, they seem to travel a little bit and they're here and they're there and they're everywhere. And then you, I think you have maybe one other group of deer that only move in during the rut. It seems like, like, I think that drop time deer last year, mm -hmm. um, that you passed, I think that he seemed to me as though he was only there I never during had, the rut. And I never saw him prior to, but now when he moved in, he stayed, mm -hmm, you know, he right. came in and just like dropped in and said i'm here and i'm gonna be here how late did he stay he was there in the late season because you got late season you got pictures and, of him in like november didn't you oh December. Or like, yeah like the later half yeah yeah and ryan ended up picking up his sheds or a shed so he him. stayed all the way through yeah okay so right. i have my theory on some of these deer is like uh is like who's a good one straight up straight up's a really good one i believe that some of these deer that have the, the dual home range, meaning, and when I'm saying dual home range, summer, range. summer and a, and a fall. fall, I think that's also typically their winter range. Now, I think the food can, can move that a little bit. And I think that that goes until, like, May 1 or May 15th. I want to go back and the trail cameras look, and I think there's a flipping day almost. Because the reason I say that is we had two deer last year that both are super unique at their bases. And if you remember, and they got lots of kickers and everything else, and when they started growing, um, we could recognize them. And the one was showing up every single day. And then the other one we saw during turkey season and had a few pictures of him, and we knew it was him because his bases were rather large. 
like abnormally large where you knew it was that deer. Right. And then all of a sudden, I think it was like the same week, we quit getting pictures of both of them entirely. And those deer had both been there from uh, the fall, winter, all the way into the spring. And then I think that that was the time that they did one of these shifts where it was time to go to the summer range. And I think they left because that, that one deer, we never got a picture of him again since. We know he's alive, but we haven't gotten a single photo of him. Um, and then the other one left until fall, and then he came back. Well, here's what I, I – one of the things that I, I guess I want to see happen to know whether or not we've got a, a, a something I can hang my hat on. I can think of two deer. Both of them are dead now. Both of them lived at, right there around the house that never left. Okay, Junior would be one, Juice is the other one. Okay, and when they had that core area, I mean, like, they were living on a mile Mm -hmm. circle, you know, and never left. I'd say, and I think you... Maybe even smaller? Well, I think, no, I think you're absolutely correct. Like, that was the kind of area that they were living in. But I feel like they were spending 60 to 70% of their time in 25 acres. Right, right. Okay, but but the one element that has changed since those two deer, food. The the farm where where they that bordered us that had the food has been gone now for a couple years, and it seems like I haven't had that homebody now. I haven't had one to move in and stay in there, and I'm I'm wondering if I'll ever see another one do that where he moves in and stays without the food there. Now there's food close but not as close as what that was. Do you remember what the food was specifically? It was either corn or beans. Corn or beans. Yeah. No, so yeah. juice, there was no food there. Yeah, it was still. Alfalfa is all. No, uh-uh. no, the, the CR, the stuff that's now CRP was Mm-mm. still, yeah, that's only been two years, Warren. No, that wasn't planted then. <clears throat> it's been, it's been since junior was like four that there hasn't been food there. Trust me, because that was one of my favorite shed hunting spots, and it, now it's been crap. Well, I'm just telling you. Well, I'm, I think if I think you may be correct in that juice that year, but that was the year it came out, meaning he didn't have a chance to change, or or would he have changed? Would it have caused him to start? I don't. And I and this is just I mean speculating. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. I got to see. But you had a question, so ask it before you forget. So when it comes to like moving from the summer ranges, and depending on whatever fields you have like across from you that are ag, so like beans, corn, do you think that there could possibly be a small differential of when they move based on the field? Because like you guys always talk about where if it's a corn field, they'll stay in the corn, and you'll see people's with like. Um, just on anybody like on social media, you'll see the drone videos of like bedded down corn that has just been torn up. Um, Easton and I were on one of your farms last year looking at some trail cameras and he was showing me how the beans just get torn up across the the front half of the trees because it's just an easy source. They can come in, come back out. Do you think it's a difference between corn and beans of when they decide to kind of move or do you think it's just instinctual? I think that there's a, there's a system to the whole thing. So, and, and, Corn is not holding them only for food. Mm-hmm. Corn is holding them because there's cover. They can live there. They can actually, where the beans do, typically don't get that tall. Yes, a buck can go out there and sometimes embed down, and then the beans are tall enough that you can't see them. But they're not necessarily living in a bean field like they can in a corn field and never come out, and you can't see them. But on beans, it's when you see the beans dry, and there's different periods of what's going on. Definitely Midwest whitetails are the most visible buck-wise late August. You know, that that even mid, I would even say maybe the whole month of August, pretty good. Um, back, because the beans are just right. They like the beans. The bo- beans taste good. They're um, not the beans necessarily, just the, the plant itself. Mm-hmm. And so they're in those bean fields. They're easy to see. But what happens is when we get to August, end of August, and we start to see it's almost like as soon as they start to even think about coming out of velvet, it changes their everything. They'll quit coming to those bean fields like that. But at the same time, the beans change. The beans start to turn yellow. Uh, the plant does. Mm-hmm. And when, and it seems like they avoid the those. They, they don't. I'm not saying they won't go in the field, but they're not feeding on that like they were when, they, when it was really green. So that's more of a, the pattern of change as far as agriculture goes. And then the corn, I don't think that you can do anything about the corn until they take it out. Yeah, like I think 
partly what he, he's saying. Like you'll have you could have deer that are in the corn mm-hmm. all summer, and like you'll never know. Or they and they may be, or so I think that too. It's we just need to note a lot of people listening probably already know by now. This applies to the Midwest. Everything we're talking about. If you live out west or back east, I'm not sure what you guys have, but out west, your deer. I don't know. I don't. We haven't hunted. I haven't hunted enough whitetails out west to know if they move their areas and stuff like oh. this. But I think they probably move a lot more than our deer here. But like corn and beans here, it's pretty easy for a deer to be in a cornfield. Oh yeah, and walk across and go to a bean field. But we, oh, I love. I, Dad and I know feels the same. Like we love when they cut the corn because typically you'll get several new, new bucks. New deer. Oh yeah, that's yep. what he always said. And especially like that was interesting for me to see because the first year that I started working here, I was very new to the whole thing, trying to learn. So I was always asking questions. And the first, I think it was probably, I don't know, mid-October or late November when they were really starting to kind of get that all down. Every day he was been like, all right, there should be maybe somebody new here. or We should start seeing like kind of more tunneling in. And that was especially when we saw kind of swoops the one time because he was actually the first big buck that I've ever filmed. And so, I mean... I, I think it's interesting to see how many deer you actually get when that corn is cut. Yeah. Well, like, the, and and I think the, the one that we, and I, we didn't have a name for him other than the double main bean buck. That was probably the most prolific. So for all the people listening out there, we had a deer that um, we had a farm to hunt. You and Easton were hunting it one day. Mom and I were in a different tree. These guys see this deer, but yet they couldn't, they got some footage, but it's at a distance. All you can tell is it's a big buck. Mm-hmm. Okay, I agreed with him, and he was out in the cornfield in a waterway in the cornfield, and they're trying to tell me that they saw this big buck. I'm like, did you film it? And they're like, yeah, we got some, but when we looked at the footage, I couldn't tell what it was, but Warren had looked through binoculars, and he's like, it had two main beams on both sides. So main, quadruple. Quadruple yeah. main beam I've buck. Seen, I've yeah. seen the pictures of this buck. So anyhow, long story short was they're telling me this, and I'm telling them, there's no freaking way because along the edge of this cornfield, we had about a 40 acre section of timber there that we could hunt. And it was good. I mean, like we saw lots of deer in there. We killed deer in there. Well, I had, I had three cameras along the edge of that cornfield and I had not one picture of this deer. So I'm definitely telling them, I don't know what you saw, but I don't think that it's what you think you saw. It might've been this buck or this buck that I had pictures of, but I didn't have any pictures of this deer. So we end up going and hunting, and, and everyone fills their tags. And I come back to go check my cameras one day, and the corn is cut. And I was like, ah, cool. you know. And I go through, and I check my cameras. Not on one camera, not on two cameras, but on all three cameras, almost every day, in like daytime hours everywhere, is this freaking quadruple main beam buck. And he had been, he had to have been living in the corn and never coming out of there. They cut the corn. He didn't have a place to live. So he had to move into that timber. And all of a sudden, there he is. Which that's how we saw him, was he was in the waterway. Mm-hmm. So we were able to see him between the corn. Yeah. And it's yep. hard, it's hard to miss a rack that big. I mean, holy cow. Oh, this deer was cool. I mean, he was, <laughs> looking back, he wasn't a fully mature deer, I don't think. The, na- the neighbors ended up killing him on a push with a shotgun. Um, but he was, uh, I mean, he was probably three. Yeah, he'd be a hard deer to pass just because oh, of the he uniqueness was of wild, it. Wild, super wild. Well, that he ran, he came out in that um, waterway, and Easton and I both saw him. And then we were like, it was like with Tina Sasquatch, you know, because we were looking <laughs> at each other and we're like, did we really just see what we thought we did because he went into the corn. Mm-hmm. And then he came back out, like just enough to confirm it, you know. And, uh, and I have, like, a photographic memory when it comes to deer, as you know. So, like, I was telling Dad, I'm like, no, I'm telling you, this deer was so unique. Like, we do not have a photo of this deer. I'm 150% confident that this is that there's a quadruple main beam buck down there that is huge. Um, so, so with that, I guess, just so that people understand, without a doubt, I, I believe there are some deer, not all of them, but they will move into the corn, and you may never not you may never see them until that corn comes out. Mm. They, which which it, is makes it a great place too to be putting a camera in some of those waterways, or yeah, I mean, don't get your camera run over. But in those cornfields, can be a really productive place for for pictures. Absolutely. So, and this was kind of one I thought of before we got on here, and I'm glad you kind of mentioned that. So, from my perspective, being a new hunter, kind of wanting to get on my own, I go out able to find by some apparently, as a lot of people say, the the unfound greatness of 
knocking on a door and getting some permission ground. Right. If I'm looking at this new place, and you guys have said it before, look for all your sign, where would be the best place to start putting out a couple of trail cameras on a on a new property like that, especially for a new hunter, with with all of that information that we just talked about in mind? In the summer? Just Yeah, you get there late summer. Like, where where would you kind of start out? I'd be putting in a corner of a bean field. I'd probably, bean? Sit, I'd probably go drive by there or sit there one evening and mm-hmm. watch and see where the deer come out. And then I'd go put a camera there. And if you can, I, uh, we don't put out really, we don't really put out mineral blocks anymore mm-hmm. just so that it's easier. We just put out the antler king food blocks, which the deer destroy. Um, but I would put out a food block, you know, just to try to get them to come over and, and stop for a second. But, uh, what's unfound greatness? I'm trying to think of that. Like well, you guys, really you guys always, you guys always talk about the, the permission ground and how everybody says, oh, you can't, you can't get on permission ground anymore and you can't like knock on doors, but it's like the, the unfound yeah, but greatness. What he's saying, he found, like you he found, found greatness. One. You found it. Right. Okay. I got it. I, I meant <laughs> okay. what he knew. Um, but so, I, I agree with Warren. I'd be looking at some type of a funnel area from food, look for places on food edges. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are, I mean, the other thing is if you don't know the farm, that's at least going to be an easily, easy place to get in and check your camera and get out without having to worry about walking into the timber. You may not, but, but at the same time, it's, th- this is the time of year when you want to venture in. If you need to learn a place and you need to learn where their bedding is and stuff like that, you'd rather do it now mm-hmm. and, and okay, I, I might bust a deer or two, might bust a big buck, but I'd rather bust him in May or June than I would in September 15th or whatever, you know, two weeks before the season starts. Mm -hmm. So um, I would probably be doing my tromping around now. And then the other one, man, that I think that a lot of times we overlook is water sources, is especially small water sources, you know, um, a creek bottom or something where there's a little puddle and all of a sudden you find a whole bunch of tracks in there. Um, It can be a great way of catching, and and it's already a natural funnel for, a natural place for them to stop. Mm -hmm. So you get a good picture. Um, the other little tip I would tell everyone is that if I'm putting up my cameras on a trail, like we're talking about, I'm probably going to go to the video mode because number one, I'm not going to get a lot of pictures. You know, I'm going to get some, but I don't expect it to be just picture after picture and video just shows me so much more. I get multiple angles. I can click on it and stop it. I can, you know, and especially a lot of times if there's bachelor group of bucks, here comes two or three bucks and then you don't see the fourth and fifth and sixth buck. Mm-hmm. You know, and so th- I, I've gotten to where I really love the video mode. I think, uh, so let's go to these individual deer though now. So let's say that you have a a giant deer that you want to kill. It's just, we're going to be theoretical here for a few minutes. Okay. Absolute monster deer. You have history with him. Okay. You got a year of history with him. Or let's just say, let's say even say two years and you get summer pictures of him every single year, but then you know, as soon as he sheds his velvet and, and uh, September rolls around, he just disappears. So you're trying to figure out what you're going to do, what you're going to change to try and kill this deer. What do you think your odds are of killing that deer? Probably not very good. Unless I, unless I own enough ground that I can change the food. It, that, it, and, and or hold more does, which in my particular case, I can't hold anymore. I mean, we're overrun <laughs> with does. You think um, changing the food? I think that possibly if you could change the f- or get more food like on you, you might see him later in the season or something like that. I don't think you're going to be able to do anything to his October, you know, rutting area where he's used to going. That's where he's going to go. Or, or that different fall range. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. if if I have one of those deer, um, if I was you, I'd be panicked, or or <laughs> I'd be trying to. What I'd part, try be trying to do is get as much permission around that piece of property as I possibly could because I don't think they go. I don't know. I mean, honestly, I'm not sure because we haven't had too many do that. We've had one um, straight up was probably the best example we've had of that so far where like somebody. Two, two miles, two yep, and a half miles. If you were getting summer pictures of straight up all the time, like, and we've had other one, Ralph, that I guarantee you somebody was just constantly just, <laughs> got a just losing <laughs> their mind because they've got summer pictures of him all the time. And then he's just gone yep. every single year. And uh, straight up was the best example we had of that because he was on one of our places in the summer, and then he would leave, and but he ended up on one of our places in the fall, so it was great. But at the same time, I don't you you did never ever had a chance of killing him where he was in the summer. No, not one. I mean that once that deer left, he was never gone. Went back. 
So I think if I was had a deer that was doing that to me, I'd be doing everything I could to get as much permission around it, um, trying to figure out where he's at and, and trying to hopefully, hopefully end up where he's going to move for his fall range. Um, that's what I would be doing. So now let's just take the opposite. And you got a deer that you, he's always on you all through the fall, and you, you're definitely his core area or his home range for the fall period, but he's always gone during the summer. What do you feel on that deer? I just, well... And and I have one, I had one like that, and I found his summer range. You know, I kind of and I looked for it for a couple of years, but it wasn't until I had exhausted all the other places. Then I finally went. You know, first you go south, then you go north, then you go. Oh, look! I found him way east of my place. Um, you know, or whatever it is. So try to find him. But if not, I don't sweat it too much. I I, I mean, I trust that he's coming. You know, that he's going to come back because they're habitual like that. And I definitely think that when it comes to rutting activity they are they are bought into wherever wherever that place is that they want to be they want to be there every year do you think that it's solely the rut that they're moving for i don't know if it's the rut i'm just saying that, that coincides with when they're when that fall like, like straight up you know I, I always knew when things were getting close because it was like october 10th something like that whoosh, he'd move yeah he'd stop getting photos of him on one farm and he'd show up on the other and once he was there he was there. I mean, like, he didn't venture anywhere after that. I mean, look, I picked up every shed from that deer where he would come to. It's it's really kind of incredible when you see that. We had another one this year that I just remember that beat all of them. That deer that I found, I found a shed. Uh, the one that was kept going to where Easton, Easton's other place. Oh, yeah, the that goofy thing. Five miles. Yep. Oh, yeah. That was a five-mile trek, and we'd five see him on a farm something. and then where Easton was hunting. Yep. And he would do it, and then and he was left our left the one place, and then stayed on the other one five miles away for the entire hunting season, and then he came back to the other farm five miles away during late season. So he was one of those that went there, in my opinion, strictly for the rut. And I think, for instance, this year, if you were going to try and kill that deer on the farm that he spends the summer on, during once if you don't kill him before October tenth, fifteenth, you. On that particular place, you're not killing that deer, right? Because he's going to do it again. I think yeah, he's going to leave. Mm -hmm. Yep. You so. had um, last year a deer that you were kind of sweating about, and we were all all knowing about him. But he didn't come in until late, and it wasn't until a day where you and I sat on trying to get me a deer where we like literally just walked up oh, on him, yep. like legitimately walked up on him. Now, and you've had pictures of this deer for multiple years. What of, was the date of that though? Ah. Uh, it was like it was October I, still. It was late, late, late October. October, but like you n knew his habits and when he usually kind of comes back. But he was just being very different. And now there could have been other sources that we may or may not know about about whether he was that late or not. But do you think there could be like um, like a weather change, like if it's a drought year or something, could that affect their habits on when they actually kind of move back to your fall range, or do you think they just come back? I, th I think that his was the injury. the injury. I think that's what slowed him up, and that's why I wasn't seeing him. You yeah. know, otherwise he would have – I mean, I had three years where he had done the same thing. I have no reason to believe that he wouldn't have done it a fourth or two years, and then he wouldn't have done it the third. Going off of like a straight up, going off of some of these others that they, they're they really – but at the same time, it will be very interesting to see this drop tine buck thing. We call him a drop tine, but it's not much of a drop tine. It's just right. a little – Two inches, yeah. Yeah, it's, but anyhow, if he moves in and stays, it'll be really interesting. He'd be the first one that I would see that as he got older, he was willing to completely give up a range because I do think there's something to killing certain deer that could free up. You get a bully buck that's in there running a place and he's just smashing on everyone and all of a sudden he's gone and I think that you could get some deer that move in and say oh wait a minute I got a new spot here I can hang out yeah you know I don't I mean I don't know that you know we'll just have to see if that plays out the way that it should we didn't I don't have one yeah. Ju juice was one that I feel like no one was moving in that area. No, yeah, but he was a boss. I mean, yeah, like that deer yeah, was there was no one beating on that deer, or they could, and he was one of those that's dumb enough. He's right. going to keep going. <laughs> um, I think that the so is what I would tell you is if you have a deer that never is always gone every summer, and he shows up in fall, I don't stress. Don't stress now. Now you stress a lot, <laughs> and I know a lot of other people that stress, and 
And I think that the hard part for those ones is that was there outside factors? Did he get hit by a car? Did he right. break a leg? Did something else happen? But otherwise, and and I, how many times did I tell you on that <laughs> one in coming. particular? How many times did I say? I said, he's already there. You just need to relax. I said, I promise mm-hmm. you that deer is there. And then what had happened? You guys walked up on him, and yeah, he was there. But he's also got a leg broken, so he can't breed. And so he, in my opinion, he he becomes almost unkillable. I mean, he doesn't because you follow. Kept, but you were checking your trail camera every single day. Not every because, day. But every oh, three, three or four days. Dude. Every day. Because I but knew. At, but we did. I'll give it to you. You knew he'd done it within the same day mm-hmm. or three-day period for like two or right. three years in a row. So you were expecting. Yeah. At some point here, he's going to be here, and I want to catch him when he does it. Because because he would pass through. That was my my fear was I need to know when he gets here because when he gets here I got six days seven days and that and if I and I better be on him and I better have the wind right I better have stands in the right location when he shows up and because then he moves on and goes a little farther north where it's much more difficult he just on the fringe of me hunting him at that point yes and so that so when was you my, say that's the next thing I think that's really interesting fringe what do you mean by that when you say when you then you'd be on the fringe of hunting him. So I think that these deer will get core areas where they'll live. And so a lot of times that core area could be 20 acres, could be 40 acres, 100 acres. But they'll wander or they'll chase a doe or whatever, and they end up off of that, out of that core just a little bit. But they're going to do everything they can to get right back in there. Yeah. And so sometimes that fringe works in your benefit. Sometimes it works against you. You know, and it's not, when I say fringes, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a fence line between you and the neighbor, and that's the fringe. It just seems like these deer have a certain place they won't go. You see a certain road, and it's like, okay, um, Juice, for instance, I think I had gotten two pictures of him ever across the road on the um, west side of the house there. Right. That's that's it. It was like he would circle around there, but he would never go across there. Yep, it's like a line. Yep, and I think that's really interesting to note too. And I think that I think that when when deer get older, um, at least your ones that seem to do this summer shift to fall shift and have this little home territory, I think that you're in for one of two things. Either one, it's going to get easier to kill them because they they stay to a smaller area, mm-hmm. and you can find that smaller area and you can kill them, or two. It's going to get harder because that smaller area either is you're on the fringe of, it's not on you, or or you can't find them. Like that, we had a deer called Hammer that I really wanted to kill that deer. He's that huge four point shed that we've shown everybody. And right. the, and the problem with him though was we if I was going to kill him, yeah, I had to dedicate my entire season to sitting in one stand. There was only one stand where you even had a chance at killing that deer, and I had to be willing to sit in it. Every single day, and I couldn't, one, the wind would have to cooperate to do that, but two, I don't have that kind of patience. I couldn't (laughs) do that. Now, late season, he changed a little bit, and he would move on to us completely for a shotgun. And he, but he was smart. I mean, that deer was, that was a bullwinkle smart type deer. Like, he was really, really smart. Uh, But he wouldn't show up. He wouldn't do it until, I think that we would get, the reason we'd get a few pictures of him in, like, October I think he was kind of one of those travelers still, and then, but we were just on the very fringe of his yep. of his area. Uh, so I think that that's where it gets really interesting. And then it, the best case scenario, in my opinion, is you got a homebody deer, where he's on you all the time. Those ones, I think, you just need to pay attention to what their their habits are and be patient and go in the right times, and you got a good chance of killing that deer. But Absolutely. there's other ones like, you know, if I have a deer that like this one that we were talking about um, with Easton's that moves five miles. If I was you, the first 10 days of the season, I'd be super, super aggressive because you're you're not going to hurt anything. Like, right. I mean, shoot, you may bust him, but at the same time, you have a limited time before that deer is going to leave, and he is not coming back until the late season or whatever it may be. So you better try and kill him at that time. So now what do you think? Now I, have, I do have a, a, a thought here that throws a few wrenches in this. So like a bullwinkle, that flipping deer really – confuses me in the summer because if you think of the entire five years that we knew him we got um one two two or three photos of him but i think they were on the same day 
when he was four in the in summer in velvet. And then we didn't get any at five, any at six, any at seven. Oh, no, no. Then a lot at seven. A lot of summer pictures at seven. None at four or none at five and six. A lot at seven. And then hardly any at eight, but a few summer pictures at eight. But then during fall, I knew exactly where he was going to be. So what the frick was that you're doing? Well, I think that he, if I remember correctly, almost all those pictures that you're talking about were all on the same camera. It was one at in, seven. Yes. Yeah. The at eight, no. It was on a different camera. Which I'm at to, seven, so remember, at seven four, was that the he whole, was he was in the cornfield. Yep. The, and we'd only had a few cameras on there at that time, anyways, and we got like two or three at the cornfield. Right. Um, and then at seven, he was at at what we call the hole. Uh, a lot, and that was when he had the weird, humongous bases. Right, that fell off. Yeah, um, and he was there a bunch. So I don't know. Maybe that was, I don't know what that was. I mean, it was a weird deal. And then eight, we got a picture of him. I think just we got one picture in velvet walking by, and then one of him like sniffing the feeder from like seven feet away, and then running. And then we got one picture of him in the in the bottom and by the river. And then I, I don't know. Other than I would say that we were not in his summer we were on the fringe of his summer area. You know, but again, don't stress because we knew where he was going to end up in the fall. I mean, he yeah, was it always just, there. it just really boggles my mind. Then like Ralph, what the flip with that deer cuz uh, for gone. 5 for 5 years straight though, not one not one velvet picture of that deer. And then all of a sudden, we started getting velvet pictures of him when he was like eight years old or something. The year he died, at least I believe that he died, um, we got a, a few photos of him, really good photos of him in the summer. And I, I par- possibly, you know, is there some contributing factor that he got older and someone ran him out of his summer summer area? Did something change if he was going too far away? The, the farm changed and someone went in and banged around with something and, you know, turn to because there's a lot of that goes on out here where ag fields and stuff like that are grow the fields are growing because they're getting rid of the fence rows and things like that and did, had he had a favorite place and something got jacked up i don't know you yeah, know I but know. i wonder i think sometimes too it could be just that um i don't feel i feel like majority i mean there's a few like a nomad that's an outlier but we'll see what you think i think that 85 percent of them they don't go very far in the summer at all like they're pretty much going to the same Typically area to no. bed and the same food, and so I think if you're off of that a little bit, you're not getting pictures of them. You know that's why you just get an occasional photo because you're just not on on their travel path, and they're not really venturing off it. I, I that agree. Time. Although we've had a, a <clears throat> more deer than I expected, more bucks than I expected to to not follow that. Nomad was one, but even Swoops did the he traveled back from where he was in the summer where we were seeing him over to where I'd get pictures of him, which he didn't go on like Nomad did and go to the other end where he was two miles away. But he w- but he made the, the trek once in a while, and then I would go back over to the other field. So he was moving two miles, but he wasn't doing it very often. That's so weird. Yeah. But I would tell you, too, I think just trying to think of more examples for people that may be in a similar scenario like Magnum this past year. Magnum, when I first had history with him, was during season. Uh, I think when I ended up looking back at it, we didn't have the first encounter or see him until like November 17th or 18th. And uh, then we saw him a bunch during the rut there. And so then I was nervous that, is this deer here just for the rut? And this is one of those deals where he's on his last kick trying to find the last doe and and I'm never going to see him again Mm -hmm. Um, or what. And then he ended up staying through well into like January. And so then from that point, I was confident. I think you guys all knew. I was like, yeah. if I don't get summer pictures of him, I'm okay with it. I know this deer is this deer is going to show back. back up here at some point. I, that was the only thing I wasn't sure of is I was hoping he wasn't going to be one that showed up October 20th or something like that. I was hoping he was going to show up before then so that I could start trying to game plan to kill him. And uh, the first pictures I got of him was October October 1. And they had just cut the corn, too, and across, I think, 
on the farm neighbor in it or something like that. And so I'm guessing that maybe that's where he was or it was just time that for him to come back. But that deer, I was pretty confident due to the fact that he stayed through January that he was going to come back. I was really, really confident he was going to come back. I just, I was hoping it wasn't going to be where he came back mid October or later right. October waiting on the rut. And you had him pretty, pretty honed down from everything that you've been doing research wise. Cause I mean, you were, you were pushing straight on him from pretty much just trying to figure out where to put trail cameras. And then you eventually found like kind of the, the fringe of where he doesn't like to go. Kind of like what juice would do where he just would kind of stop. And you were telling me you never got pictures of him in a specific area. And then all of a sudden about kind of the same distance, but on like the other side of the farm, he would be there. Yep. My, so I, I never <laughs> wanted to say any of it because you don't want to jinx it. Yeah. But I knew I was going to get, I knew I was going to kill that deer mm-hmm. because I knew I was going to have a, a shot for sure at him just because he was another one of these weird ones where he had a really small area. And that's what you were talking about. Like the, I had one camera that when we first saw him was only a hundred and some yards away from him. And then I saw him there. I saw him like six days in a row. I think it was a day or two in between, but I had like six encounters with this deer in a 10 day period, which is most people know that's, that's especially for a borderline 180 inch deer. That's freaking weird. And, but yet I never had a single photo of him on that camera. And so that to me established, okay, that's a border there. And then pretty much the same thing this year, got one photo of him on it one time. But other than that, he didn't go there. And so then I had, so I, I was pretty confident he was staying in such a small area and and just running that little area that I was like, as long as we don't totally run him out of here, he's going to slip at some point and come by me. But I don't, I think you got to kind of get lucky to get those deer. It's not, yeah. those ones don't come around all that often. Well, and when you have a deer like that, push him. Me- yeah, meaning hunt hard. Go, go in because he doesn't want to leave his core area. You know, he's not going to leave on one, one encounter. Um, uh, Junior is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I, mean, I think six different times he came out the same trail. That's it, what I think d- during the peak of the rut, which makes no sense whatsoever. It just exact same trail, exact same trail. I, we'd have to go back and look at time, but I feel like it usually was within fifteen twenty minutes of the oh, same yeah. time too. <laughs> I well, think that I, I, that gives me a theory. I think I've said this before too that I I think I wonder if some of these super dominant deer get on something they're comfortable with. Magnum Junior, where Junior wasn't body wise dominant, but he was always had hot dough, so he must have been willing to fight, right. or people gave him some respect. Um, where they they do what they're comfortable with, and they get the and the dough they force that dough to do it, and so that can make them one of two things. One, you get people saying they're locked down twenty four seven because they're not seeing them, right. but that's because they're doing the same flipping thing over and over. Where if you can find that thing. You're in the money. I yeah. mean, we almost killed him. I think that one, he was another, what, six or seven encounters? I and he just got so lucky. I know. So I was lucky. sitting there with mom twice when and had him at 15, 20 yards. I mean, the, the only thing is, the only reason that she didn't, I didn't let her shoot the one day he was at like 24, 25 because that grass was tall. And she, and she only pulls 50 pounds, and I was just like, I just don't think this is – Let's get him to walk right here in front of us out in the, oh, you know, there was shorter grass there, and he just didn't do it. I had him at 16 the one day and couldn't shoot because it was that bail blind. Right. Wasn't that back when he was, like, behind the bail blind, or was he still in front of no, it? No, he came, ran right in front of it, I mean, 15 yards, and, and wouldn't, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, like, I did everything, and he would not stop. And then he was 40 yards or so is all to the left, but I couldn't shoot there either because the bail blind didn't have enough windows. Mm -hmm. And I'd seen him like three or four other times from that same um, blind. I mean, like it was over and over and over, and then I killed a deer, I think, and then that's when mom started sitting there. Well, Um, looking back, I would tell people, I mean, huge mistake. The bail blind, the only time we've ever owned one is because we were taking it on a goose hunt. And that was it. I was I, I got one to give to the guy that was taking us goose hunting because that's how he said we were going to film the geese and us in layout blinds and then the video guys could be in the bail blind to film. I'm like, okay, that was part of my payment to go do what we were going to do. And so I thought it would be a great idea to put it in this field because it would blend in. I should have just put a double bull blind there and we w- you would have killed Junior. 
Yeah. I mean, had that been a doe, and, and it would have, it sat there for so long. I was more afraid of the farmer being fooled and picking <laughs> my blind my blind up than I was Junior because he didn't care. Yeah. You know, but so those of you th- thinking that you got to have something that blends in exactly like everything else, the the bale blinds are not designed, at least the one we were using, was not designed for archery hunting. Yeah. And it cost us, and it cost us in a big way because multiple times, you know, we kept thinking that, well, just leave it because it's working. He's coming out there, so if he'll walk in front of it. And, he, I mean, he did. He walked in front of it, but just never would stop in the right spot. So he was extremely either – Either he was really, really lucky or we were really, really cursed or <laughs> something because, I mean, I couldn't believe it when she told me. I'll never forget. She's like, here comes a doe. And I was like, yep. And she said, there's Junior. <laughs> and I'm like, no freaking way. Not, there's no way he's coming out that trail that you because you hunted him and seen him come. I'm like, and he freaking walked right out there. And we went back again. Here he comes. Here comes a doe. Here comes Junior. Same trail. Yep. Every time you saw a doe there coming out that trail, you just, just get your heart comes. <laughs> going. Yeah, your heart just went nuts because you're like, oh my god, is he back there? And freaking most of the time he was. <laughs> you just you didn't know which doe it was going to yeah. be. Right. So then, with that, if you would have done this strategy, would it have either kind of worked in your favor or not? Could you have maybe hung a stand, kind of either not right on the edge of that field, but could you have kind of hung a stand like maybe 40, 50 yards back, kind of? To get there, or do you think that would have really busted him, and then you would have been I, totally screwed? I don't think. I think he was bedded fifty yards in the timber, right? Right. You'd have to see that timber. It's some big cedars, and it's easy for the only place that I think you could have put a tree stand would have been to the north in that little sliver of trees. Yeah. Because the, getting in there, I think you might have bumped him mm-hmm. trying to go into a tree stand. If you stayed out where the blind was at, there's a little sliver of trees. I don't know if there's a tree in there big enough to put a stand in. Well, the problem that you had, too, is you needed to be in the field mm-hmm. because it was when you're in the food source like that, that's one of the things I hate about hunting food sources. If it's a good one, there's lots of deer that come out there, right? Yeah. So we were having lots of does come out. And if you were, I think if you were in, if you were on the edge of the timber where they were or you were there close, the, the odds that somebody was going to wind you and freak out and screw it up before Very he high. ever got the chance to come out was really, really good. Right. That was where we got really lucky on, most, on him most of the time. That he was coming out early. He was one of the first like, deer to show up, so he'd get there. But you have to you, – you you should have killed him. If you'd have got in the other blind, you'd have killed oh, him that day at 3 o'clock. Yeah, Easton and I would have killed him. Easton and I literally – we did get in that blind. Yeah, you for 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I made a huge mistake. I, Uh-oh. We had another blind that was um, a few hundred yards away, and uh, – I can't remember why we decided we felt like we needed to go there. Maybe we had trail camera pictures or we were just thinking that. No, you'd already seen him several times come out of the other one. And I yeah, kept I know, telling, that was saying. on the edge of that food plot and I had put in. And the food plot came in pretty decent. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to remember why, what our theory was, was on even switching blinds. Um, so, anyways, East and I, I can't remember why, but there was some reason that, and I think maybe I, we were thinking that if he comes out in the food plot, at least you're going to kill him. You know, mm-hmm. like, with the other one, we kept seeing him, but it was hard to kill him, obviously. We are thinking, we get in the food plot, we're going to, and he gets out. If he if he shows up there and he comes out there, we're going to get a, a shot at him. And so we convinced our, or I convinced myself enough, I guess, to go there. As soon as we sat down, I was like, screw this, we're going to the other blind. Because <laughs> I know he's, I know he's going to do it. I know he's going to do it. And, and then at least I know that he's there. Here, I'm not sure. I have no clue. And, uh, and we freaking did. And we went and we saw him, though. So mm-hmm. I thought I was yeah, super so, smart so at that comes, point. He comes back telling me how great he is. So you, I told you, we went to the – I didn't go to the blind you told me to go to. I went to the one that I know, and he came out there, and I almost killed him again. And I'm like, you're kidding me. I couldn't believe it. I was like, well, okay, you're right. It's not till like a couple weeks later when I go check the trail camera on that food plot. And I was like, what day was that when you guys filmed Junior in that blind? And he says, it was this, this day. Easton was there with me, and I'm looking – and I said, Really? Because that same day, he's in the freaking food plot at like 3 o'clock, two and a half hours before. So he had worked his way all the way back down to the other end of the farm and then come out the same trail again. We'd have been in the blind like 20 minutes and shot him. Because his pictures, too, he's like 20 yards broadside. I mean, yeah, he's, he did everything he needed to do to die. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go with that deer was just lucky. Yeah, Because he kept making the same, oh, he I got, wouldn't say mistake, but 
to us it would be a mistake. To him, he's just living his normal day. Oh, yeah, he got really lucky. Well, I was on full draw on him um, another time from a stand, too, and he just walked th- at th- he was 30 yards, and he just walked through the gap fast, too fast. And I can't remember. I think I, I man at him, did everything I could, too, and he just and he didn't hear it or something, and uh, so he just got really lucky. Oh, no, that's what it was. It was I needed him to walk on just the left side of this tree. Mm-hmm. He walked on the left side of the tree. I could shoot. He walked on the right side of the tree. He was right behind, and I couldn't shoot. And he walked on, and, like, the trail goes like this, you know. And he freaking walked on the right side of it. So by, like, a yard. Did the same thing to Karen. I mean, but he's following a doe. I mean, right on the doe. And the doe comes up and comes around the tree at 24 yards. I'm like, okay, Karen, here comes Junior. I mean, like, be ready now. I'm like, this is over. You know, the doe has already come. It's wide open. And he stops. And then instead of following her, he cuts her off. And so he stays, like, 34 through the brush. I'm like, what are the freaking chances? that? Because he was right nose down just like coming, you know. I mean, the only reason I knew it was him is just telltale rack as he, when he had his head down. And I was like, we got him, you know. Here he comes, 24 yards. You're going to sink an arrow in that sucker. <laughs> Man, the more we talk about that one, the more that one hurts. Yeah. It was so much fun chasing him, though. Yeah. It's I mean, fun when you know they're there. Yeah. Like, Juice was fun. Because, I, like, I know sure. he, after your first shot, he stressed you out. But, like, once we knew he was back and stuff. To me, that one, it was it was fun. It was stressful for you because you were trying to kill him. Right. I had already killed a deer, and so I was a camera <laughs> guy, and I knew he was there. It's never, when you're not the one with the stress, it's it's a lot easier to, you know, see these things, I guess, trust it, right? right, right. You're like, oh, man, he could leave now, where when you're not the one with the stress, it's like, no, he's not. There's no reason for him to do that. He's going to be doing the same thing, mm-hmm. and we're going to get a shot. And so, like, that was fun because you knew – you know, juice is here somewhere. I don't like the ones where, where it's like if you get one opportunity at all, you better figure out how to make it happen, no matter what, because you're never gonna see him again. Like those ones, those ones are, are you got to be really careful with yourself because I think you can stress yourself out way too much to where you take the fun out of it. Base, <laughs> base drop, base drop was that way. Yes, where I lose him and couldn't keep up with him, and we were hunting fringes, and eventually, you know. That morning when we when Colby and I did kill him, it was, you better get this done. Yeah. Because if you don't hear, that's, you probably ain't seeing him again. Yeah. And that's a lot of the – I never really thought about it, honestly, either. People ask me, you know, how do you decide what deer you're going to chase? Or or we talk about what deer you're going to chase, you know? And a lot of it for me is picking one that I know is that he's a homebody to that area. Chance to, yeah. Yeah, because I don't really want to have to try to – be hunting a fringe, you just you just get really limited. I mean, there's not a lot that you can do when when you're on the fringe there and you can't go across the the fence or whatever. You're just you're really limited on your opportunities and what you can do there, and um and it'll really stress you out. So if I'm going to do that, it's going to have to be a real big deer to get me to do that. The the other thing too, I think it just depends on where someone is in their hunting career, and I I love. So Nick was Nick was the one with me when we took all the strategies last year and put them all together. That was... And it was so much fun. You know, I mean, like that Sunday when I was putting everything up and, I mean, I'm moving two stands, I'm putting up a blind, I put in a rub tree, and I was like positive. This is going to work. I know this is going to work. I know that from the trail camera photos that I have of where I think this deer is going and coming, the wind direction that I'm feeling right here, what I need with this stand here and this blind here. I mean, if we'd have been in the blind, that would have been, that would have been the only thing better. He would have walked by. <laughs> I mean, it truly would have been because you knew that from the setup or you knew that from that morning, like that morning you knew it was going to happen. No, no. I knew that Sunday. I he, knew we were getting a shot. He had texted me. So like, when you got in that stand already that morning, though, you knew that it was, you knew, like, you're like, we're going to get a shot today? About 10, 15 minutes, I was sitting <laughs> in that stand, and I looked through my binoculars, and I'm looking at the tree is trashed. Yeah. And I then I told him right then, we're killing one. He texted me on Sunday, like, when he was doing all this, and he said, okay, here's the plan. We're, we're waiting until this wind, and he's got this, like, down to, like, a, a spreadsheet in this text, and I'm just, like, looking at it, and I'm like, I'm 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 looking for a good day. We get there, the 10 15 minutes this tree is just demolished and I think about like about 5 minutes after that we saw that little saw buck. First deer. Yeah, yeah. We saw like a couple does run across the top of the hill and then all of a sudden he hit the horns and I'm just 
and he's telling me how this should work. Like I've been kind of building up the rattling horns of my head from all of your guys' experience and everything. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, all right, I'm just kind of looking around. And all of a sudden it was kind of just quick. All of a sudden I look over and I just see this horse of a body of a deer standing on top of the hill. And I looked at him and he's said it before. He always over exaggerates and everything. <laughs> Cause I'm, I'm new to every deer is big to me, blah, blah, blah. And I just look up and I'm like, dude, no, there is a massive deer on this hill. I think <laughs> I, I wonder, and maybe this needs to be its own podcast because I call it Hunter's gut. Like there's days. Oh yeah. Where you don't, you're not even to the tree yet or whatever. You could be just driving there. Oh, a lot of times I think it does happen when you get out there where like there's days where I'm in the stand and I'm kind of having fun and we're just, and we're laughing and giggling and, and carrying on and shit. There's other days where, like, shit's real. Right. Like, I can feel it. And I'm like, we are going. Sometimes I feel like we're killing him. Like, or or I shouldn't say him. It depends on, you know what I'm talking about. There's certain Oof. hunts where it's like, we're getting a shot. Um, and, and I'm like, every, every sense is on the, to the nth degree. Because I'm just waiting for it, you know. And I know. And then there's other times where it's like there's going to be an encounter where I'm really confident that I don't know if I'm going to get a shot, but I'm going to, I'm going to see him or, or we're going to see something or there's something that's going to happen here. And I, and I, I guess where I'm going with that is I wonder if that is something that is ingrained in us and in our instincts that allows us to kind of feel that and, 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 have an understanding of what that is or is that from experience and you don't realize it that you're just putting together all of these experiences that you've had over your hunting lifetime and it gives you that sense that that information of this is all these conditions are right for this you know and you know like I've been reading some books lately that are about reconnecting your mind and having positive thoughts and things like that and I definitely think that there's something to that that um, because I just, I mean, I can think of it when a day I shot three does, I told Drew that day, I'm watching the farmer cut his corn the night before. And I was like, Oh, er, change plans. We were going to this other spot. I now know where we need to sit tomorrow. And I was just a hundred percent confident. I know which way the wind's blowing. We're going to sit right here. Watch this. And when I shoot the third doe, there's 12 does in the video in the timber. I mean, we saw like 60 deer out of the out of the stand that morning. So there's certain times when I do think that if you were to if someone was to quiz you, all of a sudden you find out that it's a lot of things that you your mind has learned and is triggered saying the wind is right, the time is right, this is right, this is right. And then when there's so many things right, there's like you just hide. It's just like, oh my gosh, I know. I mean, in in this particular case, what I had told Nick was the only thing that I need is a northwest wind. That's and we'll go in as soon as I get the northwest wind. I didn't expect it to be in a day and a half. Yeah. I expected it to be a week later or whatever. And but honestly, we're sitting there and we're, we'd only seen three or four deer. We're not like we mm-hmm. were seeing a whole bunch of deer, which I wasn't expecting to from that stand either. When he says there's a big buck on the hill. You know, and I'm like, oh, it's it's Brahma. You know, I mean, this is not a big buck. This is him. This is the one we're looking for. And he comes right down. But, I mean, the day you and I shot Juice, I knew we were in the right spot. And look at, we saw what, like, we had seen like 12 or 15 bucks or something like that by 8 o'clock. Yeah, he was the only one left. The only one that <laughs> we hadn't seen. Yeah, You know, um, and it was, but I knew we were in the right spot, that we were going to the right spot. You know, um, and but at the same time, we have to admit there's a lot of days when we think it's the right spot and they get by. You know, just because it's the right spot it doesn't mean you're going to kill them that day. Junior would be, you got out of that blind and went to another blind to sit there and you saw him. I mean, your gut told you we need to go back here, you know, and we didn't kill him, but everything was right. You had that encounter. And yeah. see, I say when I, I refer to hunting and deer hunting, especially as a chess game, and they lost when they got within bull range. I mean, I won that game that day. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I, I may not get to go home with the, the trophy, but I, I won that day. They, they made, they'd made the mistake I needed them to make. Yep. Yeah. That day I knew 
Bullwinkle was that way as far as, like, that day I killed him, I knew. The, the only thing I, I was told Dakin, I was like, if that, we need the, if this wind dies, like they're saying it's going to, it's on. I just, I can feel it. And when that wind died, both of us, I mean, we're standing up all night and we're just, nobody said a word. You know, you're afraid to move right. even because you're, it's in your mind, at least in my mind, it, in both of our minds, and it was not a, is he coming? It's when. when. And then we heard those two bucks fighting and the density of the, of the fight, there was no question. It's like the odds that it's not Bullwinkle with, with that, <laughs> what it sounded like is like no, 1%. Oh, right. So, and then it happened, but I've seen yours with elk is on another level. You have some ability with elk <laughs> that I don't get. The, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm telling you, dude, it's the, the wildest thing I've ever seen hunting period was was him one day when we were in Montana. We were on this, uh, we'd been hunting these elk for I don't know how many days, quite a few days, and we'd been seeing a lot, but they we just were having a hard time. They were under a lot of pressure and getting messed with a bunch, and so we were sitting up on this mountain, and every morning they would go out in this, they'd go out, or every night they'd go out in this alfalfa, and they'd come back, and, you know, they'd come up into the mountains and try to get on them. They'd do that every day. Well, this day, for whatever reason, there was no elk, right? So mm-hmm. we're, it's like 7 a.m. I don't think we'd even seen an elk or heard a bugle or anything. Or if we had, there was one like a mile and something away, like a long, long way, and like five miles to get to it. And uh, 9 a.m., nothing. 10.30, I was like, all right, are we ready to go to the cabin? Because it's just like deer, you know, like. He got his breakfast. There's sense probably on. <laughs> no reason that they would be out. They they would still be out in the alfalfa, right? So mm-hmm. we're like, they got busted or something. And he's like, no, we just need to keep sitting. I'm like, okay, whatever. Eleven, nothing. I'm like, are you? How about now? And he's like, no, no, thirty minutes. Okay, eleven thirty. I'm like, what about now? And he's like, no, we just need to. And I'm like, now it's like to the point. It's ridiculous. You know, it's like it's flipping noon, dude. And like, what the hell are we doing? I need to eat lunch. Like, why are we? And he's like, no, we just need to. He's like, just hold on. We just need to. We just need to sit here. And then like twelve thirty, here comes a hundred elk. <laughs> so, yeah, comes right back there, and I'm like, <laughs> call it. <him. laughs> and I'm like, him. what the flip, dude? <laughs> like, how the frick did you know that? And then we go up there and kill one. Jeez. It was like, it, what was that? Because you knew for some reason, you just knew. To to I don't know if it was the day. I don't know if it was the, you know that. Um, and again, I, I mean, you can ask yourself all these things and know that they're. I I don't know. Uh, the The day that mom um, shot Crown Royal, I knew we were gonna. I knew we were gonna get into those elk. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's another one. I mean, but there's certain times. Yeah, but when that just, one there was like inclinations to go off of like lots of elk bugling. That morning, there was nothing. nothing. I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I can't, I can't tell you that the wind, other than maybe the, I mean, I'm trying to look back and go, was it the wind? You know, everything was right that we just need to give them time, especially when there is stuff being pressured. Let them do the pressuring. Let them move around. Let people do what you're doing. Are we missing what, are we just adding to it by when we walk down to go get lunch? You know, and then they move in and then we miss them. So it's just, I, I don't know. I don't know what that, I mean, there's been times when I've told mom, she's the one that picks up on it and points it out to me. When we'll see elk and they're going a certain place and I say, we need to go this way, which directly away from them. Mm-hmm. And we end up being right, you know, and she's like, well, what, how did, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I wish I could, if I could figure that one out, I could sell that. We'd be millionaires. Well, there's a, you have something there that I don't I don't know what that was because I remember that that one in particular was there was nothing there was no available information whatsoever that would have given you any any person any logical reason to sit there until twelve thirty. You're just almost None. sitting there looking like okay he's he's gone insane for a day. No, all of us were we were all like not insane <laughs> but we were just like I mean I they trusted were laughing him, but I had to tell them be quiet they were giggling and stuff like that. Yeah, we were just it was just like why. Because the cabin wasn't that far either way either. I mean, it was easy to just drop over the back and go to this cabin. But it, and he's just like, nope. And but that's what was compelling about it. it wasn't like, oh, I think we need to sit here or anything. He's just, it was a, it really was just dead faced. We need to. He's like, nope. We need to just hold on hmm. and then hold on and hold on and hold on and then 
all of a sudden here comes a hundred elk. I'm like, what the frick? Oh, that I mean, I would compare that to the your turkey last year in the afternoon, because you asked to leave multiple times, <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> Let's just go. Let's just go. And I'm like, no, I know they're over there. Uh, they're gonna come back by here. And sometimes you just no. You know, you just, I don't know what that is. I, it's not like I'm talking to them or whatever. And then the hens came over, a couple of Jakes came over. And, you know, then when they were leaving, he was like, well, then, okay, we can go now because it was the wrong birds. Yeah. I'm like, no, they're still there. You know, I know there's two toms in here and they just need to come over the hill. And sure enough, they came over the hill, <laughs> walked right to, the, to us, you know. So, but yeah, I don't know. It's just, um, I wish... I, I hope everyone out there will give it that extra 10 minutes, that extra 15 minutes or that extra hour or two hours. And um, I think that a lot of mine has become, I, I think I'm more patient now than I used to be. Yeah. Well, there's definitely times too, though, where you need to just trust your gut. Absolutely. Like I knew, like I kept, that's why I had kept hounding Alyssa on Mr. Liss there. So a deer that Alyssa has been trying to kill because she, uh, she gave him a nice, a nice mark several years ago didn't hurt him at all but hit him right and then we've been so his name is mr list now we've been trying to kill him for the last few years i knew we were gonna get shot at that deer but it was the same it was a bullwinkle scenario as far as we just had to keep sitting that same spot with the right conditions over and over and over and over and she was like can we please go sit somewhere else i'm like nope you're just gonna keep going here and and he's going to do it like I'm not. She's like, yeah, it's been like five days since there's been a picture of him or anything. I was like, that's good. It means yeah, it means your odds are getting in yeah, your favor. Yeah, you're you're really starting to see it. <laughs> yep, he's gonna do it. And then he did it, and she shot over his back. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, but now don't get me wrong. We have the other happen, and and the wide ten. I was not. I was sitting in a tree, just like you were talking about. One of those days where all I was trying to do was stay out of mom's way. Yeah, mom was was my my in October 22nd or something like that. I'm thinking it was just a nice day. It was a little warm, you know, and I was like, ah, oh, this is just fun. If a doe comes by, great. We're going to get – Brock and I are going to get some footage. But primarily I'm trying to hopefully mom, – mom's out, and I'm like, let's get her a deer. And, you know, hey, man, I just saw antlers walk by down there. I wonder what that was. I couldn't tell. So <laughs> let me whack the antlers together, and I hit them together. And minutes so later I look over, and here comes the wide 10 walking up the road. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, he's going to walk right in front of us. You know, I mean, this is not what you're – there was there was no feeling. Yeah. Other than I was just – there was also no pressure. I yeah. was like, yeah, 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 I'm just having fun, you know. This Good day is, to be out in the woods. Absolutely. That was that was what was weird about Magnum this year is, I mean, I knew we were on him. Eli knew. He's like, we're, he's like, we're, we're going to kill him this morning. And he was confident. He's like, we're going we're gonna to get a shot at uh, – at Magnum this morning, I was like, well, I mean, I think we got a good chance of seeing him. I think about the same chance we've had every other day. Uh, you know, like this was a second setup from the day before when we had could only see five yards. So it was like, because we went in in the dark. I'm like, I'm sure we got a better chance than yesterday. You know, and he's like, no, he's like, I got, it's, it's going to, and I was like, I was, I was just confident in our, what we were doing that we were going to run into him at, at some point. I wasn't necessarily all that confident in that morning. I mean, it wasn't even at that time. Same thing, though. I didn't even have really time to take in our setup or anything else because he came in in five minutes. Right. But that's awesome when you when you have when your cameraman hunts with you long enough that he starts to pick up on. Ooh, we're this is getting right. Oh, the wind's right today, or you know, or there you're thinking something because the last thing that doesn't matter who we want to be is the cameraman. The hunter's the hunter. He's the one that's going to make the choice on where mm -hmm. we go. And so, but when you're sitting there and you're thinking something as the cameraman and then the hunter says, here's what I think. And you're like, mm -hmm, yeah, I think we should do that too. You yeah. know, I know the day Nick was so new when we killed straight up. Oh my gosh. You know, but I told him we're going back to the, the, what I call the road stand. And I was like, we're going to go back to there. And he was like, okay. You know, I could tell he was kind of like, Happy. I don't know. I didn't know at the time whether he was happy because he was comfortable with that. He's trick. always happy. <laughs> Anytime. Okay, let's go do this. That's good with me. Well, we were getting ready before that, and I was just like, I was kind of sitting there, and I was like, man, we haven't we haven't seen anything. And Colby was still like filming with us right. at the time, and he gave me like face paint. So we paint our faces and I'm sitting there. I'm like, all right, I got some new mojo. It's kind of like when you're hitting in a slump right. and you just get back in the box and you got something new, but he had texted or something. Uh, it's a bad day to be a deer. 
And I'm just in the back of my mind, you were confident in it. And I was like, it might be a bad day to be a deer. And then all of a sudden, we just were kind of sitting there waiting. Swoops came out. He was, I think, the first buck that yep. came out in that field. Of course, that was when the whole thing started when I said, man, that looks like a good deer. And he goes, shut up. I don't want to hear that ever <laughs> again because you guys had all said to leave him. And, of course, I hopped on the train, obviously new hunter, and then he left. And then I think – you were the first one to see the antlers go by in the back of the yeah, tree over the still fence. In the timber, yeah. Yeah, and then all of a sudden here he comes, goes to the left of us, and I'm just sitting there and my heart was kind of just I was intense the whole time. I, I I change arrows. Well, I remember <laughs> I remember telling him though cuz Colby texted it's a bad day to be a deer. Or no, I how think did he, he say that? that every day though. Yeah, um, <laughs> and it was something cuz I told you I was like I just want to answer him. I can't remember what it was that I wanted to answer him, but it was that it, and so that's what we sent back to him after we shot him. Um, Or or maybe he sent something said, it's not that bad a day to be, or it's a good day to be a deer. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. It was something that he was saying that we weren't killing one today. That was what he said. And I, and I answered, Oh no, not it. it, it, I mean, it could still happen, but I didn't answer until we had actually shot him. Yeah. Yeah. But, I am I think all deer hunters got to be superstitious to some extent. Oh, yeah. I'll change my arrows. Like, if I get one where I keep seeing a good deer, but I can't get them close enough, <laughs> it means I need a different arrow. <laughs> you know? I'm like, well, that one's the see em arrow. <laughs> this next one's going to be the killing arrow. <laughs> that's why I could never, you know, these guys, that they'll write a deer's name on the fletchings or something. Oh, that's like, bad. I can't do that because then you got to be dedicated to that arrow. That's, that's not yeah, that's some, jinxing that. That's some really bad juju there, I feel like. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, hopefully we ended up way off topic. Yeah, but I think but it was interesting. I think we covered some stuff that people would like, and it will help. Hopefully, um, the the thing that I guess I would add or or close with is that, man, if you get to that point where you start seeking out one deer, um, no, you're going to run into some really frustrating days. You, mm-hmm. You're definitely it, it. It's it's the deer you want to kill moves to a different farm. You're probably better off having two or three that you're good with because something can happen or change, and then you're going to be just stuck. Unless you got some rare deer that's, you know, absolutely huge, and you need to hang your season on it or something. And and the other one would be a number. I'm I'm with last year Easton had put a number and I'm like man don't do that yeah that's really hard it's hard enough to that when the number is age you know I'm saying hey we want to kill a five year old deer but any five year old deer you know um not. It's got to be a five-year-old deer that scores X yeah. because, man, you are boxing yourself into a little tiny hole, you know. Well, and that score doesn't mean anything. No. I mean, like you could, in my opinion, Hammer is one of the biggest deer we've ever had by a large margin. And that deer, I think, he might have made 170 when he was, when he was six. His prime. Yeah, like, yeah, when he was his prime. Like, he, he might have been close. But I know when they when he killed him, the neighbor killed him, he was 162. And he was still huge, huge, freaking giant. I mean, is that first shed that we have of his is what sixty five or something like that? Yeah, sixty seven. Sixty seven, and as an eight. Yeah, and the and the eye guard is like barely an Two. inch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and like uh, and it's that antler huge. is bigger. It oh, doesn't dude. necessarily score bigger, but it's bigger than most antlers that are in the mid seventies, hands down, because it's a freaking baseball bat. So I think that you can't put so much emphasis on score. Yeah. I think Easton was doing that just because he felt like, since you and I had been fortunate enough to kill yeah, a couple, he, that he needed a one that said one seventy. Yeah, I don't. Th- he can have which we're not even in it either. Technically, no, gross, but not net. Yeah, the, David Mitchell's the only one that as it, yeah has, has netted into the could get in there. That thing is a oh, it's freeze. beautiful deer, and God. that's because God flicked that deer's eye guard. That's why. God, God really likes Mitch, and so when he, <laughs> wow. so that yeah, year we had know a, that. yeah, God he had really a, likes Mitch. A split eye guard, and if he hadn't broke that eye guard, that split off, mm-hmm. he would have netted one sixty nine and like f- seven eighths or six eighths or something. But since he broke it off clean, he was one seventy and two eighths. So yeah. Yeah. well, we know Mitch really likes God. Well, I th- I'm telling you, he's got a red phone in his house, <laughs> and he just picks it up <laughs> and. <laughs> talks directly and and i can tell you that from turkey season when i told yep. you you're having issues 
Call Mitch. Have him that, talk to God. Did that for Easton I, this year. We do it all the time. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to go there all the time because I don't want God to stop taking his calls. But yeah. <laughs> God's like, you're only calling me to kill stuff. No, Mitch isn't oh, that way. He, you know, I'm sure he brings up all the other oh, things yeah. and everything like that, but he throws that yeah, in there. Yeah, he does that in between taking all the elderly people to their hospital appointments <laughs> and everything else. That, I think dude, God, that dude is one of the best dudes under the sun. Yeah, I think, yeah. The, but when mm. God answers, you know, it's and Mitch has his list of praise, the things that he's praying for, you know, it's like, oh, well, if, what I just t- t- take all those. So if your turkey was in there or Easton's deer was in there, you're in, man. Granted, yeah. my... <laughs> My turkey wasn't there because I had texted him. We were yeah. giggling about it out here before we like left to go hunt. And I, on the way to David's house that night, I gave Mitch a ring and was just like, "Hey, what what what's the possibility?" Just as like the inside joke, like, "What's the possibility you could maybe send up a quick prayer?" And he goes, "Well, have you been praying?" And I said, "Yeah, just wanted a little extra." <laughs> and I called it the Muju. <laughs> because like the, your your Wuju, I called it the Muju, like the yeah. Mitch. And so he was. He was laughing about it, and he goes, "Well, let me know how tonight goes." And of course, like that night, we Got had close. the yeah, we had the whole encounter. Almost shot a bearded head, and then of course the next morning we were dealing with everything. Um, birds pitched down the wrong way, and then we were calling that one bird the whole time. Shot him, and then I shot Mitch a text after that, and I said, "Well, it worked." <laughs> Easton's deer was on the way there, wasn't it? Yeah, you guys were driving yeah, over there and talked to Mitch. The but now, now see, there's what back. That's another scenario though, where I was like. We're killing it. We're killing a deer tonight. I mean, but but that came from learning, learning. Because I can tell you, when he, we hung the tree stand, I did not think we were in the right area. When you guys saddled the one we, day? No, the next day. The oh, next day okay. when we um, sat, we, we so we saddled that day, and I thought we were we had a good chance. I didn't know we were going to have a chance in the next ten or fifteen minutes. Mm-hmm. And he almost killed a deer then, but then he wanted to put a stand on that in that block of timber we mm-hmm. got in there and i thought we're off the deer too far i think we'll see deer because you could see the whole cornfield but then they came out and walked across the field and then the one came right to us when we rattled and i was like holy cow well then that's when i was like we need to move this to right there we need to be sitting right there tomorrow and if we get the right wind we're golden and we did it we came in dropped the blind climbed in he was like there's no freaking way we can set this blind and hunt it today I'm like, yeah, we can, there, especially because there was a bale there. I was like, I don't think anyone's going to pay any attention. And sure enough, it worked, you know, but that was, but but you had a lot of factors telling you that you were, you, the deer were there yesterday. We mm-hmm. didn't bother any of the deer. The deer should come back the next day. The weather was the same. The weather, the wind was right. Everything was in our favor, so. Yeah. All right. Well, we probably have bended your guys' ear, and you've gotten to hear a bunch of stuff about turkeys, deer, a little bit of everything. We just want to thank you guys again from the Raised Hunting team. We're missing Easton today. We're hoping that we're going to hear some good news from him. Um, if you see him or hear from him, say happy birthday. It'll be a little belated by the time this goes out. But yeah. Do us a favor and share it with a buddy or leave a review. We yeah. really appreciate him. So this is the Raised Hunting podcast signing off. Thank you, guys. You going to wink for him? Sure. Thank <laughs> you.